Welcome to the Interior Analysis Podcast. I'm your host for this one, the leading person, Jelani Kelly. I'm Vengeance. Okay, got it. That's how we're starting. <laughs> yep, that's how we're starting. <laughs> well, I'm David. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm we a... have a special. G- okay, you wanna? You can do it yourself. <laughs> I appreciate the alley. Uh, I'm Hassan. We have a song back. We've had a song a couple times on the show before. The homie, he's coming to talk about a film he's been anticipating for a little while now. Why don't you talk about that, Hassan? Yeah, man. I t- this film went through it. Initially, it had Ben Affleck as the lead actor, with uh, Deathstroke as the main villain, and then Matt Reeves was director. And they were going to play with the Arkham origin storyline where like if you guys seen that trailer where Batman and Deathstroke are fighting on the rooftop, they wanted to play along with that because fans really love that. And then from there, it got dropped, canceled, new actor, new story, everything. But when I found out that Matt Reeves was still attached to it and the talent he was bringing on board, I definitely thought this was going to be something special. And now we're here. What live action movies has everyone seen with Batman? Let's start with David. All right, all right, all right. I've seen a lot. I grew up on Batman, so we're going to go through it. I've seen the old school 1960s super camp Batman movie with Adam West and Eartha Kitt as Catwoman and Cesar Romero as Joker. Then, of course, the 1985, I believe, Tim Burton movie, Batman. Then I saw the sequel to that, which was my personal favorite Batman movie. And then I saw all the weird 90s movies, the one with Val Kilmer, the one with George Clooney when he has the hard nipples on the bat suit. Um, and then I've seen all of the Nolan movies. I'm not a big comics person, but I did really get into Batman comics as a kid. One of my favorite comics was The Dark Knight Returns or whatever by Frank Miller. And I really loved it. Well, going to hate this. I really loved it because he beat Superman's ass. And... I don't like Superman. I think he's, like, super overrated and just, like, stupid. Because, like, he's literally just a Superman. So I was like, is this all we're getting? So it was cool to see somebody give him something. Because I was just like, ew, I hate you, Superman. And I was so, so hyped to see that put to the big screen. Like, I remember it just so vividly. I was like, Batman v Superman's going to be it. They're bringing in Wonder Woman. And I remember my dreams dying in front of me as I watched that movie. (laughs) So I never saw the Justice League, and I still haven't to this day, Snyder Cut or whatever Joss Whedon did, because I just, I don't, I just can't do that. Can't do that to myself again. All right. Yes, on. Echoing those sentiments, I agree with that Superman take for sure. If that was a tweet, I would retweet it and put it on my tweet page. Man, guess who we're not having back to the show. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I see it every single live-action Batman movie there is. Um, Multiple times for each, with the exception of Adam West. I may have seen that twice when I was a kid, maybe, because it was just on TV. Yeah, I I like some of them more than others. Definitely um, was disappointed with how Batman vs. Superman went. But I was impressed with Ben Affleck as an actor. I think he was very intimidating. And, like, I just felt like the script they gave him just didn't really warrant the Batman people wanted. But, yeah, I think I'm, I'm familiar with every single live-action iteration. Yeah, yeah. Well, surprise, surprise, I've seen the whole Dark Knight trilogy, being the Nolan Knight that I am. That's most of my knowledge. And then I saw the Batman v Superman Ultimate Cut and the uh, Snyder Cut of Justice League last year. But definitely less familiar with those pretty much all of my batman knowledge comes from the nolan trilogy i personally have seen returns i think i remember the penguins scaring the hell out of me bleeding black blood and whatnot don't know why that stuck in my head i think the dark knight when i was younger but like kind of a little bit most of rise also kind of they were like playing in the background most of the time from like that's kind of how i saw those justice league so both the Joss Whedon version and the Snyder Cut and Batman v Superman. Real quick, I want to gauge who everybody's favorite live action Batman is. Just jump in. Michael Keaton, but Pattinson's a close second. Fair. Uh, comic book accuracy, I'll say Ben Affleck, but just in terms of writing, Robert Pattinson. I guess it's a tie at the moment between Pattinson and Bale. I want to say Pattinson for myself. I think he was really good. Not not Bruce Wayne, but we'll get into that. He was really good. Um, 
Batman. If you guys have initial reactions for the movie, you're, you're welcome to run down some things. Okay. Um, I'll just go over really quick. Initial quick reactions, when I walked away from it, I really enjoyed it. It didn't really feel as long as I really thought it was until I looked at the time, and then that's kind of when I realized how long it was. I think it's because I was just invested into it, but I was aware of how long the movie was going, if that kind of makes sense. I feel like I need to watch it a second time to get like a full set of bearings on it, but just off of first and his reactions, I really liked it. I felt scared of Batman and scared of Riddler, which are two things I never felt was properly achieved in any other live action version. And I was really, really impressed with the soundtrack and marketing that the film did. Because I feel like the marketing is what made me enjoy the film. Those were my, my initial reactions. You were never scared of Jim Carrey's Riddler or something? That's a very good point. No. <laughs> <laughs> I guess before my initial reaction, what I wanted from the movie, what I hoped the movie achieved was I wanted a good Batman detective story. And I do think this movie does that. And I wanted to see how scary the Riddler could be. Because, like, as much as I love how crazy, kooky Jim Carrey's Riddler is, like, the Riddler really is a sadistic person. And they are much more akin to, like, Jigsaw than really doing the high kicks that Jim Carrey did with Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face. So it was nice to really see that, to see the Riddler doing that. So those two things were, like my initial reactions first time walking away i was like all right it hit on that mark and then seeing it a second time like the go around reaction i had was like okay it's not a perfect film but overall like i really do enjoy it and i think it's worth the second watch and i know a lot of movies aren't like that especially not three hour long movies because you can really feel that but even the second time i watched it i think i enjoyed it more because there was just so much getting thrown at you when you watched it the first time with like characters and aesthetic and tone. And I was trying to keep up with it all. And then the second time, since I had like more of an idea of what everything was going to happen and where we were going, I was like, okay, no, yeah, this works. I like Batman in this tone. Yeah, I, I liked it as I was watching it for sure. Two and a half hours of this were really solid. There were like 25 minutes that I didn't really need in like the end of the second act. They were tolerable. Like Asan said, I think I also need a second viewing of this before I can, like, really solidify my thoughts on it. But aside from anything else, like, I did enjoy the experience of watching it, for sure. Like, it was a good time. Walking out of the theater, I was like, yeah, that was pretty good. And then I walked back home with the friends that I saw it with, and they were, like, pointing out all the stuff that they thought was, like, really goofy which definitely affected my thoughts on it like over the past couple days because I was like processing through what they were pointing out. And um, there were so many things that they thought were just insanely goofy in it. I, I was actually kind of defending it, which they were like, that's kind of uncharacteristic for me. Like usually I'm the one who <laughs> is like overly critical. Anyone who's listened to this show probably would agree, but I was kind of defending it a little more initially. Definitely there is some goofy stuff in this. I probably wouldn't have noticed, except that one of my friends I saw it with is like the master of laughing at things that are not played for laughs. And they were like, they, they were literally the only person in our theater laughing at many points in the movie. Wow. So that definitely affected my experience. I'll have to see if that tracks whenever I watch this again. But yeah. Definitely affected the experience. Off the top, in my head, for initial reactions, it was long for me. I felt the three hours. I thought the movie was over when Riddler was arrested. And then there was a whole like other half hour left. I was like, oh. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to look at look at my watch or anything because I wanted to be like invested and fully engrossed in the movie. And uh, well, I tried. A lot of dull moments for me. I don't think it needed to be three hours, but I don't think that about any movie. Even Endgame. I don't think Endgame needs to be three hours, but I feel like a lot of people agree with me with that. I'll give you it didn't need to be three, but I would say it would have been fine at two and a half. Sure. All right. Full disclosure, there, this might be an explicit episode. Uh, I'm going to try my best not to curse, but I'm I'm going to give what was asked of me. Oh, the last yes. podcast. 
I don't know. Whenever we decided to do this was, I think, when I requested that you do your Batman rant. So okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just jump into no uninterrupted. Jump into my, uh, mm-hmm. my thoughts on Batman. We're gonna. David and Evan have been long awaiting this. So, without further ado, first off, I want to say my biggest problem with Batman is his overzealous fanboys. These fools think Batman can beat literal God with prep time, and that shit is really annoying. I tried to think back when I first started as liking Batman, and I want to say when I was a kid and familiar with Justice League, like the TV show, I think around the same time the show started popping off, they were like Burger King or McDonald's toys or something. They had like Martian Manhunter, Flash, Superman, and Batman. When I would play with my action figures, I had no idea what to make Batman do because he didn't come with accessories or anything. He came with like a really cool cloth cape that was black. But uh, it, it didn't come with any accessories or anything. He didn't get like a Batmobile or not even like a Batarang or or nothing. And it's a, from a fast food place, so you don't expect it to be any good. So if I did play with him, all he would do was punch and kick. Not a great start, because what the hell do you make Batman do as a kid if you don't have anything else to do with him other than just the action figure, right? Then once I got a little older, started getting to more uh, comics and death battle and such, that, that YouTube channel everybody's familiar with. Um, I started seeing Batman fight other superpowered people that weren't any of his villains, and he was, uh, sometimes he would win. It was the first one I saw was Batman versus Spider-Man. Didn't win that one. And people in the comments were hot. They, they were raging and destroying their keyboards and whatnot at the fact that Spider-Man can beat Batman. You can imagine how baffled I, baffled I was finding out Batman being Superman in the comics was canon at some point. Like in David's stupid comic, The Dark Knight. Stupid. <laughs> Stupid. Frank Miller's piece of art. I grew up consuming media and TV shows about superpower people, including things like Naruto's anime, games I was playing at the time, anything. Batman's unpowered ass didn't do it for me. This is why I lean the other way towards Superman, because he can do anything. And he can beat Goku, but that's another story. His villains, on the other hand, fascinated me because of their tragic beginnings leading them to gain superpowers and how they take revenge on Gotham and all that. Except the Joker. Fuck the Joker. That's another Batman character I hate, and that's another rant that probably included in this. His ideals. I think this is the biggest thing I hate about his character. Batman refuses to kill, and to quote Hassan, he he one time did say, I I bathe in blood, and I'm pretty sure that that's canon for me when it comes to uh, fictional characters. I like stakes when it comes to my characters. And when Batman refuses to do anything to make Gotham better when it comes to literally killing off psychopathic killer clowns, I dislike his character because of it. I get that's part of his character, but whatever. It pisses me off, but I understand why he doesn't kill. Great. Not coming back from taking your first life and all that, even though he should have been killed the Joker. Someone should have. And this motherfucker just couldn't let it happen, but has actively stopped people from killing villains when it would be no skin off of his back. I'm sure it's happened in the comics. I'm not going to quote any comic, but where he's probably gone out at night knowing somebody was going to kill somebody else and was like, no, I got to stop that, even though it'd probably be better for everyone involved, including the person that was going to get clapped. Even in this movie, he stopped Catwoman from shooting someone. I forget who. Was it? It was probably Falcon. It's yeah, Mackenzie. So. He's trying to burn oh, oh, top the of the thing. And, and, yeah, yeah. and he's the one who tells him. them that Falcon's behind it. And she's like, well, let's go kill him, Bat. Yeah. When you have a killer clown man that can has taken out the population of the city you claim to protect repeatedly, reboot upon reboot upon reboot, at some point you have to question your own quote-unquote intelligence. How many people have died because he protected that piece of garbage? And that's why I love Under the Red Hood, that animated movie, and why Red Hood is one of my top favorite fictional characters, because he, along with some of the other characters, I believe Harley Quinn has at one point as well, has questioned this cracked individual known as Batman, and Batman ain't really have a valid answer other than, you think I don't want to? Every day I think about killing this clown, and it's like, no, fuck that, do it. Back on the superpower thing, for example, comparing him to the Justice League, they fight catastrophic multiversal ending events all the time, 
what's this dude do? Well, I'm going to shoot up. Got to get my battle ranks together. You, you're not hanging with Dark Side like that, so so stop. Unless he gets up, uh, gets in that life draining Hellbat suit, which I don't remember how this motherfucker just he can make suits that hang with gods with just his mind. I don't remember how that suit came about. Anyway, look at Batman v Superman for example. Bad movie, bad script, sure, but it was accurate when Batman was trying to hang with Doomsday. He won against Superman because, again, the script. Uh, but he couldn't do anything against Doomsday. Superman stay holding back against him, and these Bat fans take it as a dub. But what could he do against the likes of someone out to kill him and everything around it? Grapple hook away. He has no problem beating someone into a veg- vegetable light state and then screaming at them to talk. But he refuses to do the same thing to a clown that has a higher kill count than he has dollars. Side note, the holding back thing is why I'm fascinated with evil Superman-inspired characters, because they're not built to hold back, so it's cool to see. The movie was cool, though. Wow. You feel better. Look, man, I got three I got three questions. We don't got to sound it, but I have three questions for you, man. Question one. I'm not going to sing. All right, question one. <laughs> you say you don't like the toys you get from the Justice League. You got Martian Manhunter, you got Superman, and you got Batman. And you didn't like Batman because there were no toys like Batarangs or Batmobile. It was just a cape, right? Hassan, what was he supposed to do? So you, you didn't like it because there was no Batarangs or Batmobile. It was just a cape, right? As a kid, sure. What did Flash come with? What did Martian Manhunter anything? Shoes. But Flash has speed. What did Martian Manhunter come with? He didn't come with anything either, but Martian Manhunter, he has density shifting powers. So really, the issue here is your imagination. Exactly. What? What am I supposed? I'm question trying to keep. I don't two. know, aspiring writer. I'm what are you supposed to do? Question two. Keep I'm sorry, it your canon. childhood imagination was not enough to make you satisfied with the toys that you were given. Question two: The villains. I totally agree. I'm gonna just let that go. <laughs> I totally agree. What you say about Doomsday? Anytime Doomsday pulls up, Dark Side pulls up. Like, in Batman vs. Superman, he literally dodged Doomsday, and that's all he did. I'm with you. Like, he's not equipped to fight any of these people. The Joker thing, I totally agree. That is such bad writing when, like, he like when he brings him out and he keeps killing. I'm totally with you on that. Like, I have no complaints with that, right? But I would argue that's more so on the writer's side, right? But you brought up when it comes to killing and villains that you like the villains who tend to kill more, like Omni-Man or Homelander or stuff like that, right? For examples. The Superman kill? No. Okay. But you like people who kill, and you like guys who, like, don't hold back. Does Superman do that? I said that's why I prefer the evil... That's why I added that, because I knew you were going to bring that shit up. <laughs> that's why I added that to the end. That's why I prefer <laughs> the evil Superman-inspired characters, because they don't hold back. So I like seeing Superman. I like his abilities. I wish he didn't hold back. So that's why I'm more drawn to the evil Superman. But I prefer Stop. Superman over Batman any day of the week, any day of the month, any day of the fucking decade. So who do you like more, good Superman or good Batman? Superman. Okay. I think the question answers itself. I'm ready to move on. What? <laughs> I think the answer I think that question answered itself. I'm ready to move on. Like a cross. No, I thing. heard you. I don't I don't think it answered itself. You need to answer it. The same things you're saying about Batman and what you don't like, Superman literally does the same exact thing. And the only arguable difference is that he's stronger. But, like, I I would argue it's cornier to see someone who has that much strength and not really use it. So your issue with Batman is the fact that the writers made his mind the superpowers and didn't give him, like, some sort of, like, magic and then just give it a name? Yeah. All right, let's on to the next topic. (laughs) Yeah, I got got what I need from that one. (laughs) I want to respond to just a couple of things there. One, th- th- what we were just talking about, that's like exactly why Chris Nolan wanted to do Batman out of any superhero is that he doesn't have anything special about him. That's another topic, but I've seen him talk about that. I didn't look at your notes beforehand. I'm surprised that one of your criticisms is not the one that I always hear people cite the most with Batman, which is that he should just use his money to do different things. Instead of becoming Batman, like, maybe, you know, give the social programs, like, be a philanthropist instead of just beating the shit out of dudes every night. 
there's other ways to like do what he's trying to do i'm not here to like defend batman i don't really agree or disagree too strongly with anything that you said there i just have heard that cited from a lot of other people that like batman should just spend his money differently because it's he just kind of spends it on toys that can blow things up and help him punch people <laughs> yeah i would love to see someone do an adaptation where he where we like as an audience can see him do stuff like that because like yes the bat suit can stop the joker but like the bat suit's not gonna promote social you know education or anything like that or welfare or stuff like that so yeah and it's it's said by several characters like especially i i want to say dark knight rises is the one of the dark knight trilogy where it's mentioned the most that i, I yeah. think it's alfred and maybe a couple er other characters say like the city needs bruce wayne's resources it doesn't need you to go die for gotham on the streets mm -hmm. fighting yeah, yeah. crime it never yeah. has and i kind of feel that a lot like i don't want to get too political with this but i find it frustrating that like Batman movies and superhero movies in particular, like, tend to, I feel like, focus so much on, like, petty crime as this major issue and never really looks at, like, institutional problems. Uh, but that's yeah. probably asking too much from this genre, like, because I don't know how well-equipped it is to look at that. I would love to see the genre flip towards that, though. That would be, like, that would be revolutionary, you know? Cause, like, that's... I, I would love to as well. And I wonder if Batman is maybe the hero to do it with, because, like, I, I think there is something there in at least some of the Batman movies I've seen that, like, Bruce Wayne in part becomes Batman, at least the way that I've seen it. I, I kind of feel like this is a way to interpret it in the Nolan trilogy, is that he becomes Batman in part because he doesn't feel like the institutions of the city do their job well enough. Even so, I, I don't think becoming Batman is the solution to that. Yeah. Just, yeah. I think it's just him taking out his aggression on people. I'm, I'm still down for a good Batman movie, but it is a problem that I have with the character, and I, I think several, many other people do, at least that I've talked to. Fuck Batman. Yeah, I won't argue with that. I won't say it as well, but I... I'm I mean, a lot of people have. A lot of people have. There's Damian Wayne for a reason. Yeah. I don't... You know what, Talia, actually. You know what, never mind. Mm -hmm. Fuck Talia, though. Yeah. I hate Talia, I will. Yeah. Marion Contiard, though. Um, I'm always going to be with Selena Kyle. Facts. First of all, with the action figures, I was trying to keep it canon to the Justice League and their abilities. You think I ever made Flash fly? No, because Flash can't fucking fly. You think I ever made Batman run at super speed or, or fly or punch somebody really hard? No, because Batman can't fucking do that. That's why I kept it that way. That's like a you problem, though. Because <laughs> I had G.I. Joe fighting Godzilla. Is Snake Eyes yeah, gonna like run up Godzilla? Saving Mary Jane from Rey Mysterio, and, yeah. then the, and then the Joker in his like 1990s Batman animated series outfit flew in on the Green Goblin slider. Like, I'm sorry that you were yeah. born, but that is no one else's fault. Like, I'm with you. If I walk into the theater and Snake Eyes runs up Godzilla's back and stabs him in the head, and Godzilla dies, I will walk out the theater. But in my childhood room, I'm bringing popcorn for that fight, man. That's the best fight. I saved my creativity for adulthood. <laughs> okay. Um, I agree, but like, I don't know. Tonight I'm dreaming about John Wick beating King Kong and, <laughs> and Ghidorah all at once. That sounds like a fair fight to me. You had, a, you had a John Wick action figure? No. I didn't have any action figures. This That would just be... That's, that's my fan script of John Wick 4. You didn't have any action... That's another topic. I mean, I had Legos, if that counts, but... No, it doesn't. It really what, doesn't. That's okay. so messed up. What were we talking about? What was the other thing y'all mentioned? This stupid Superman thing. Shut up. Shut up about <laughs> Superman. <laughs> Case closed. Is that so you were really It's like not. This? You're not saying anything. You're okay, this is my piece. This is my piece on it. I'll share closed. my opinion on what you said about Superman and Batman. This is why I like the Superman and Batman juxtaposition in Justice League, because I watched that show a lot as a kid. Specifically, Hawkgirl was my favorite. 
And I also loved Marsh and the Manhunter because I thought it was it was so cool that he could go invisible and just like spy on people. But so I thought like it made sense to me that Batman and Superman would spearhead this League of Justice because like you say, Batman is not equipped to handle people like Darkseid or Doomsday. And that's why Superman's there. Superman is an alien and he can handle all that off planet space bullshit. But Batman is so human to a flaw that that's why he's there, because he needs to represent the humans and be there on Earth and work with the people who are more grounded. And I think that's why his villains are so fa like famous and everything. And that's why I really was into him, too, because I was like, as a kid, I was like, I can't fly. I don't have super speed. But if I get really smart and go to karate, I could be this guy. No, that's no, you need the money, too, and the suits and the everything else that he has and a cannon and i can shoot myself out of it because i'm a six-year-old yeah if he doesn't have his bulletproof suit sorry like there's a reason the hockey pads line exists in the dark knight because you need like a his three hundred thousand dollars suit to be batman or you're i mean you're looking at it very literally <laughs> you're like i'm not gonna actually sew the cape and get a batarang and go to a fictional place known as gotham I just mean when I look at the potential. Like, there is no way I could be Superman. But what Batman possesses really is just a masterful intellect. And I can't that, be Batman either. Batman's white. You know? That's, <laughs> I just, that's how there it is. Going off of that point, I think it's something inspiring about someone like him. Because it's like, he's severely unequipped to be around his people, but he always holds his own. I feel like that's just like a cool aspect of it. You may not be able to get the richest... Like, the riches that he has, like, no one on the, on the planet has that, right? Maybe a few people do. I don't know. But the point is, like, you can essentially work towards that, I guess is what he's trying to say. I feel like that's... You can't work to become a Kryptonian and, like, shoot laser beams on your eyes and then not kill people and then make people like Jay happy. You can't work to be that. But you can work to be someone who can, like, fight people and then piss Jay off. And that's, like, more attainable. What? That's the goal at the end of the day. <laughs> the goal is not fighting crime at this point. <laughs> your, your goal is to go out. It, it, it's, it's to tell everybody to be, be become a fucking billionaire. Is that have? Kill, hey, kids, kill your parents, and maybe you too can can get their inheritance. That that's that's what you're saying. Well, no, I'm not telling them to kill their parents because that's not canon. I think his parents got killed by someone yeah, else. Yeah, come on, come on, Jelani. Yeah, of all people a... who keeps to the canon, we think you yeah. would stay. Please say there's another reason other than it not being canon. That's page one, bro. We all know Bruce didn't kill Martha and Tom. Come on. That's Batman the prologue. Batman doesn't kill you. said that's his rule. Come on now, canon. You need to dust that canon off. That's in the cover. That's in, like, the About the Author page. I don't, yeah. I'm just, I don't know what we're talking about anymore. <laughs> I do like about Batman inherently, though, like, I don't know if this is exactly what David and Asan, what you guys are saying, but, like, his initiative, I do like. Again, I don't love the way, like, what he ends up doing with that, but I like that, unlike other superheroes, doesn't have to wait to, to be blessed with powers. He's just like, these are the resources I have, this is what I'm going to do with them. I disagree with it's how he uses lot them, of but I like the yes, I like the initiative though. Like I think that is one of my favorite things about Batman is that he's just like I can, so I will. The one superhero movie that does that better, and I don't know if we want to count this, but Kick Ass I think takes that idea yeah. a little further. Like no powers, no responsibility. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to call that more realistic, but like it's kind of the same idea. So you're saying Kick-Ass can beat Batman? No, I'm not saying that. This is an interior analysis exclusive. And you said Kick-Ass can beat Batman. I actually didn't, but I like that about Batman. That was really all I was going for. I, I'm, I'm not saying he could beat Kick-Ass. He definitely could. I'm trying to think if there's anything I like about him. About Batman? Really, man? Like, like you could not like him. So I just, hard on him. I like, just like you... the way you're saying, like how he was like he has a lot of resources. Like to Asan's point, like in a different way, Superman is just the personification of resources. He's a flying god. Like, what do you have to worry about? He can catch a bullet. He can fly so fast the world can spin back in time. He can shoot lasers out of his eyes. He is only susceptible to one fucking jewel on a planet that he doesn't even inhabit anymore. I find it more fun to watch Superman fight people on his level, though. Like, I find it exciting whenever he fights Darkseid. I'm not saying it's fun to watch Superman 
stop petty no, i get that this. but like take it all away I, like on the, put it on the table like as a character design these characters are functioning very similarly just in different scenarios and one's blown all the way to shit and you're liking that because it has the bells and whistles and the theatrics and one's a more noir pulp fiction take but it's still the same shit at, like if you take it away like th these guys are operating very similarly Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure in that Justice League cartoon you referenced, Jay, that there's a scene where Darkseid comes back and Superman's like, okay, I'm not going to hold back anymore. It's like, why were you holding back the first time you met him? And Darkseid survived, mind you. I'm not going to agree with his decision. Superman's decision to hold back. I'm <laughs> saying between the two. Oh my gosh. Man. I think we can all agree that Batman is nowhere near as good as his villains. Right? Are we all there? I'm there. Okay. Okay, look at that. Well, I don't like Batman to begin with, so there's not much. But I can't wait for you to go in on the Joker, because that is when people are going to turn. People love Yo, the Joker. <laughs> he insulted Goku in this podcast. He insulted Batman, now the Joker. He's going to get everybody. I don't give a shit. <laughs> if, if I do get people after me, that means people are listening. So that's a good thing. Yeah, fuck the Joker, too. Battinson. I think he was a really good Batman. Probably my favorite live action, like I already said. He wasn't the greatest Bruce Wayne, but I had to understand he's only in his second year of being Batman. His decision to do this and thinking about the night of his parents and all that is probably still weighing on him. He has an arc, apparently. Crazy, I know. Uh, he was superheroing and shit when... Yeah, that, that put a smile on my face um, when he was like actually saving people and not just senselessly beating the shit out of criminals. Don't know why. It's pretty wholesome to see. So far, this version of Batman I mess with. Uh, also, they didn't show his parents getting shot again. Nor was he physically lifted up by a swarm of bats. Like Batman, maybe Superman, Batman. I like how studios know at this point that everyone knows these, who these characters are. So there's a lot we don't need to see about the character because they're commonalities across all versions. Unless it's an Elseworlds story. Like uh, Uncle Ben getting clapped. Unless you want to count No Way Home. What are your opinions on Batson? I liked him a lot. A few quick notes. I think he did a good job. I'm not sure if anyone here saw him in Tenet or anyone listening saw him in Tenet. I think just you could compare the way he did that role, this role, you could tell like everything was intentional. Because I saw some criticisms of him that people said he wasn't really acting or doing much. But I think a lot of his acting was in like how his facial expressions, like the way he looks at people, the way he carries himself. That's like night and day to how he was in Tenet. So I just think that's like a really big plus on his side. I noticed that he was in the costume for majority of the movie. I felt like he was mainly Batman more than he was Bruce Wayne, which is not something I'm used to in a lot of these superhero films. Like the typical formula is like they're in their civilian identity and they have two to three fight scenes and that's when they put the costume on. I like this new formula where they kind of skip the character build up and because we already know who these characters are just put him in the suit put him two years into his career so we can just see him get to action and i really like that a lot i'm not sure if anyone else got this from the film but i really felt like he didn't believe in himself and he felt like what he's doing had no end goal like he was just blindly following what he wanted to do and he was very reckless and dangerous and because of that i kind of empathize or liked it a lot more because going back to the earlier points when Batman tries to fight crime to save like the city, this Batman essentially isn't really as idealistic. He's like, I'm just doing what makes me feel good right now. And he's really like damaged and hurt. And it, I think because of that aspect of it, I like this Batman much more because it was like, I'm not sure how, what specific scene made me think this, but I got the feeling that he doesn't even think what he's doing is going to work and he's going to die while doing it. And that's why you see him so reckless and angry. It's like every time he's fighting someone, it's like he's thinking of his parents and like that's all he's doing. Which is why I like to see the growth at the end when he started to have that like realization and come around. Because he was ready to throw his life away a lot of the times. Uh, the last thing I think about Batson, I like the fact that this Batman was focused on speed. Usually Batman's a bigger guy, but like regardless of where you stand on that, I think they made it clear this Batman was focused on like speed and technique. And I thought they did a really good job. Except that one scene on the catwalk where he walked up to the guy going for his gun and then got shot in the chest. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Continue. <laughs> but, yeah, I liked how this was, like, a more um, speedy take on the hero that we're used to seeing. So I thought that was really just uh, unique. I used to think Batman was just a hero and not a, when I was a kid. Relax.
I think he was just a hero and not a superhero because he didn't have superpowers. Say something, I dare you. I said to relax. I'm, 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 I'm say just waiting say. for more. Yeah, I, yeah. You say when you were a kid, I was waiting for like the, the punchline. No, no, that's just the side move. Oh, okay. I thought you were building to something more there. I, I did too. Me too. I was waiting. I was, like, I was right. anticlimactic. I was expecting to get jumped in and it was cool. No. I liked Robert Pattinson. <laughs> did, you do, did you do what I just did? Yeah, I did a gelati take. Wait, is that it? There's no. Are you... I mean, I don't. He, yeah, I thought he was good. Okay. Is this a bit? Because I'm gonna go on to mine if it's not. But if it is, then continue. <laughs> no, I, that's all I really have to say. Okay. <laughs> I I concur with a lot of what Asan was saying. Well, in terms of this movie, like I was going into it definitely seeing Pattinson and Tenet got me more excited to see him in this because I, I really haven't seen him in anything else except his little bit in Harry Potter. But I really like him in Tenet. And after about 20 minutes of watching him as Batman, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm down with this Batman. Like, I'll see him in other Batman movies. Definitely a different take than Bale, especially his Bruce Wayne. Like, his Bruce Wayne is a lot more, like, angsty and socially awkward than... Bale's, like, uh, one thing that I think is interesting about Christian Bale's version, I, I won't make this too long, but, like, I like in that trilogy how you feel like when he's Bruce Wayne, he's, like, performing as Bruce Wayne. Like, you can tell that it's not really him. I definitely felt less of that with Pattinson here, but I think that was fine. He just, like, wears his angst on his sleeve a lot more. I liked that this version, as kind of with the Christian Bale one. Batman, in this case, is an anti-hero. I think he's more of an anti-hero here, and um, definitely his arc plays into that. I don't know if we want to get into that now. Um, Do anti-heroes or... kill people? I'm not sure if it's like defined by that, but there definitely are anti-heroes that have killed people. Yeah. I just assume most did. I feel like anti-hero is a little bit of a vague term, but I feel like Batman does fall under it, just on my headcanon definition, maybe if we looked up the term, we could clarify. Yeah, I thought anti heroes had to it had to be for a selfish goal. Like I don't think he's doing it for a selfish reason. Well, yeah, actually, that's debatable. Uh, yeah, debatable. I think it is that's debatable. Very debatable. Because you can, and it kind of depends on the version. Like I think one thing actually that is missing. Like I'm, I'm very fine that we didn't get an origin story here, but unlike other versions we don't get to hear him state his purpose. Like, in Batman Begins, yeah. Bruce Wayne states his purpose as Batman very clearly. And we kind of assume that's the case for this one. And like I said, I, I don't think we needed it. But I think there is a little more ambiguity because of that, whether he's just doing this for personal gratification or if he actually believes that he's being, like, altruistic by being Batman. Only other note for him... He definitely does not look as cool as Christian Bale, and this was not a great Batmobile. Oh, no to both of those points. No. I kind of disagree, too. <laughs> Jelani, you said that you only kind of saw some of the Dark Knight trilogy. Do you have a good image in your head of the Batmobile in that movie? The Tumblr. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And no to the suit thing. I just saw how ridiculous Christian Bale looked. Dude looked like he couldn't turn his fucking neck. Do not say that about Christian Bale and compare that to this suit, dog. The only thing I'll give you is the gliding scene I really hated. Like, I understood this movie's trying to be super grounded in whatever reality they're painting, but making it from, like, bat wings that normally glide to, like, a squirrel suit or whatever that just, like, assumes around him... I really didn't like that. I was like, even Nolan, like Nolan wanted to make this as real as possible. And even he gave Bale the wings. Like he knew the cape was necessary. So I just, that, that bothered me. But I thought he looked cool and I really loved the Batmobile. The Batmobile was fire. That, that scene with it, like the high pitch whining of it sitting in the dark before the flames came. Nah, Evan, nah, the tumbling ain't touching this. It, I, as far as practicality goes, the Tumblr was a fucking tank, so of course it's going to win. But as far as, like, coolness, for me, this Batmobile beats it. It was like and, a muscle... It was like a super souped-up muscle car. It wasn't that souped up. It it had a... 
it looked like it couldn't survive a single crash. I'm going to nerd out real quick, but the, there's a prequel book attached to the movie. And then in that book, it talks about the past between Riddler and Batman. And it, it goes back and forth. Bruce Wayne was like into building muscle cars. So he found a 1970 Mustang or whatever it was. And he retrofitted it out with the engines and everything. And that's what the Batmobile is. That's why if you look at the back of it, I'll put an image in the chat. Like it looks specifically like a, to your point, that is not a tank. Yeah, my dad was geeking out. Like, I, I didn't get to sit next to him because we got our tickets late. So he had to sit behind me in the theater. And I was one row in front of him. But he told me after the movie he was that he was geeking out once once that once that car started up. Because he has, like, a, well, he's a mechanic, first of all. And he has a, I think it's a, it's a Charger, Dodge Charger. I forget what year. 2009, I want to say. He was geeking out at that scene. And I, I felt it, too. I was like, nah, this is, this is fire. I don't think I've ever ever cared about the Batmobile before this one and nah you you wrong about that hey, but you never attacked me personally for liking Batman so like I'll respond to your points as a respectful person so yeah I mean I respectfully disagree with uh, both points but I can see why like why you like Bale's vehicle more than Pattinson's because like his 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 tumbler is very iconic right and it's just like, <laughs> it's very <laughs> iconic Oh, uh, I think the main thing, I think Bale suit also, like, everyone, like, recognizes that off rip. Like, there's a lot of Halloween costumes. Fortnite even implemented his suit in there. But the thing that always stuck out to me about Bale suit was that, like, if you look back at, I think it was the first movie. I can't remember if it was in Dark Knight, but I know in the first movie, at least, anytime he turned, his whole entire torso had to go with his neck. And I think that was just practicality with, with like, what they could design in behind the scenes of the film. I just liked how Pattinson's was an equally realistic take, but, like, he can move his neck, and, I don't know, we saw a lot of it. Even though it wasn't the most attractive suit in terms of Batman's suits goes or whatever, I just well, liked wasn't it. Wasn't it cool that he could take the battering out of his chest? Yes. Like, wasn't that cool? Like, I thought I, Yeah. The suit, Pattinson's, like, his suit was, we'll get to the suit later, but, like, I liked a lot of things about this suit. I even like the glider scene, but we get into that later. I'll tell no, you what. we don't have to. We can talk about the suit now, because I was going to mention that the suit, I heard the the Batarang in his suit was made of the gun that killed his parents. See, that's just too much. No wonder Nirvana was in his whole life. <laughs> like, you need to take it How did he find the, the gun? Going into the film, I wasn't sure if I was going to like the suit or not, but, like, there are a lot of shots where the suit just looks phenomenal on camera, and, like, the lighting really complements it. The reason why I liked the gliding scene was because it was clear that, like, he's still trying to figure out... The the way I interpreted that scene was that, like, he's trying to figure out a way to make this suit be able to work if he's on a rooftop and has to get to the ground. But he just hasn't worked on the prototype of, like, the back, like, the wings. I felt like that scene was, like, when he got up, it was like, yo, I'm never doing that again. I gotta get this, like, working. That's kind of how I took it. And there's no way for me to prove that that's what they're gonna do. Like, give him an actual glider like he's supposed to. But that's kind of why I liked it. Like, this suit is very much a DIY suit for a billionaire. He also had a collar, and the collar was popped. Locks your neck from, like, gun blows. Nobody ever thought to shoot him in the face, though. Like, he had... Yeah, in the mouth, right? Face exposed, it probably would have done some damage. I also don't know, like, what stopped anybody in the ambulance, in the paramedic team, a doctor, or the police from taking off Batman's mask from the point of him getting blown out of the church to him waking up on that table. Like, I would have been ripped that off in 2.2. Yeah. Like, they waited till he was on the table. Yo, what's under the mat? Like, it was just, like, a little delayed. Or very delayed. I got you for a solo in an office here. How about for three? That was a dope one. Yeah, I like that scene. Oh, you like something about Batman. I didn't like him. Okay, that scene was cool. What if by the end of this podcast, I'm just the Batman fan? What do you guys think? Well, then we would successfully have a character arc, and I'm always for character arcs. I'm not a fictional character. Or are you? Real people have character arcs. Oh, I never thought about that. Look, I'm not here to convert. I'm fine with however you feel about it. Um, I think I David and Asan are you're part of the Batman cult. I don't want to convert you. I just I want you to recognize that you're being hypocritical when it comes to Superman. No, nope, you know me. I'm very self-aware. <laughs> I don't see the points you're trying to make. Well, I do. I don't know how you keep bringing me back to this topic. I don't think they're valid. <laughs> I'm self-aware. I just ignore it. I also can block it out. I'm so self-aware that I block out my self-awareness. Sounds kind of like Batman, Jay. I'm not going to lie. 
You have, you have a lot of comment with him. Oh, shit. You think that's it? So, actually, Jelani's a Batman villain, so he can go, we're not so different. You and I are we, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> I've been mother figured it out. Yeah, he has a hatred now. Yeah, is there a, is there a Batman villain you, you might want to play someday? Poison Ivy? Really, <laughs> David. I'm just trying to go off your body type. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't want to answer Coming the question anymore. 2032. Man, I was, no, I was Jelani, seriously considering that shit. Jelani right. Kelly is... Poison Ivy. <laughs> All right, Evan. <laughs> I don't want to answer the question anymore. <laughs> Move on. Uh, I guess one thing I'll add is they really made him scary. I need to watch the film again just to point out specifically what they did. But off top, I think it was the footsteps. And I don't know why the beginning where they showed them looking into the alley and it's dark that you felt the fear they felt, at least for me. Because I feel like that's a typical shot in any Batman film. Like they always look into an alley. I don't know why now it did it. And my theory right now is because the first scene you see is Riddler appear in a mansion, unwarranted, unannounced, and like you, that first scene established the film as like it's a, uh, I won't say horror, but like a thriller esque movie. And I think because you go into it with that as your jumping off point, that's what makes that scene with Batman coming back scary. But I don't know if that's really what it was. But we'll see. Are there any black Batman villains? Uh, villains? Clayface in like the Batman cartoon. Bronze Tiger's not a villain, but he's one. Um, Maybe a black Red Hood. I want to play Red Hood. You mentioned Mr. Freeze earlier. That's for what's his face. I'd rather Giancarlo Esposito play him. That'd be cool to see. Huh. Would you Would you play Scarecrow? I don't feel like I'd be creepy enough. I feel like you have to have the right amount of creep and like hammy. This to to that role, like Robert England plays Scarecrow in the Injustice game, and that was like, oh boy, that was so cool to listen to because he, he voiced him. Maybe maybe I I want I want to play Red Hood. I want to go up against Two Batman face. and and question his ideas. I was gonna say Two Face, thanks. And have half of my hair shaved off. No thanks. No, they put like a skull cap on your. You think a skull cap is hiding my hair, son? Yeah, I do. Moving on. Well, to go off of what you were saying a minute ago, Asan, like I, I didn't find myself scared of Batman so much. I think that opening, the first scene with him in the alley or the subway, whatever it was, he is intimidating from the word go. It's like, yeah, this is the person that criminals fear. Yeah. And that was a big thing in the Dark Knight trilogy. One of the things he says as he's becoming Batman is like, I want to be something that makes criminals scared and they kind of they kind of lean into that with the um the symbol in like the, yeah. the skylight i think he says something like it in his like opening voiceover he's like when people see that they're like gonna run scared or whatever like there's no way that that one riddler goon's face like wasn't beaten to a pulp at the oh, end oh yeah how about the oh, first cat was the first like the first they didn't Batman. show his face yeah but he beat, I feel like he beat the, the Riddler goon worse, and he was juiced up on, it. I'm gonna guess that's Venom. That might be mm -hmm. too that's far of a guess, thing. but. Yeah, or like straight adrenaline or something. No, no, Venom, because it's green and Bane mm -hmm. uses there's, it. There's no way that they made it that color and they're not setting up Bane. But what annoyed me is that you have a three hour long movie and you couldn't set that up. Yeah, that did come out of nowhere. You couldn't set that up. He just pulled it up out at the end and just put it in his leg. That's why I wanted to see it again, because I was like, did I miss it? Was there a scene where it just went by? And I was sitting there waiting for it, and it never happened. I'm like, this is like screenwriting 101, guys. Like, come on. Yeah, like, because if that's not Venom, the way I looked at it was like, that felt like it came out of nowhere. Like, you didn't set that up at all. So for me, it's like, that has to be an Easter egg for a future movie or something like that, you know? Because otherwise, it's like, I don't know. I think it's definitely a mistake, though. You just needed one line from Alfred being like, hey, you still got some more of that venom juice or whatever. Like, it would, it would not take a lot to set it up. I'm Alfred. just imagining Andy Serkis delivering the line just as Evan said it. <laughs> I don't know if I have Andy Serkis. Oh, this was... Or whatever. <laughs> you want uh, some of that venom juice or whatever, Bruce? I don't know if that's a decent Andy Circus, but it's the best that I got. <laughs>
I, d- I definitely agree about the like lack of blood though. Like I could, I don't know if we want to get into our next topic here, but I had this under the next one. Like I could really feel this like wanting to be an R movie. They so, dropped their f bombs so early, so so early, early. and like fucking you Halloween. Feel, I was like, really? So um, you doing that? All right. Why? It felt like kind of a waste of their f word. But yeah, like, I thought I, I didn't check the the rating before I went in, so I thought it was gonna be um. R past that point, I was like, that's probably the earliest F bomb I've heard in a PG 13 superhero movie. Matt Reeves said that was like the only mandate he had to follow was make it so it wasn't an R rated movie. Because, like, apparently Warner, Warner Brothers invested so much money and they needed to sell this to a wide audience. And he talked about how, like, he likes to push that boundary. Even with, like, the Planet of the Apes films, he likes to make it as dark as he can go and then, like, not cross that line, I guess. Like Batman. <sighs> You got me. Yeah, I think this definitely airs high on the PG-13 side. Absolutely. Like, we did a whole episode last year about how the MPAA's guidelines are really vague, so it just kind of is up to them. But yeah, I could feel like that, especially the, the guy you were talking about with the Riddler goon, like his face should have been just destroyed by how hard Batman was punching him. Yeah, it was him, the guy in the beginning, and the guy who got his face eaten, like the Riddler victim, too. Like, they just don't show their faces. With the exception of the Riddler goon, I guess. They showed his face, but it was, like, clean, you know, for all intents and purposes. Eaten? Who got eaten? He had the guy in the rat. The, the commissioner. Rat he puts him in the rat thing, and he eats his face. The guy and who drops the F-bomb. Yeah. They're, like, look at his body. They pull the blanket, but they never show his face. Um, Batman and Gordon. I don't remember that scene it's escaping me i don't know why i don't think it was okay rating aside i felt like they really were making this for a more adult audience though like yeah i heard kids talking like the front row was like why'd you bring them here well i've I've seen kids at much worse than this for theaters sausage party i didn't go to that but i sat next to like a five-year-old at terminator dark fate oh (laughs) wow That's not that hard of an R, but, like, that they were there. I heard people brought their kids to see Sausage Party because they thought, hey, it's animated. It's got to be for kids. <laughs> and they were really awakened. I actually never seen that movie, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, you don't have to. It's not a need-to-watch movie. In terms of this, I, I felt like I was glad there were no jokes, and I think that made it feel more adult, for sure. Got a lot of cats. That was like the close. Well, there's a few jokes. They're just not like punchline, like ha ha he he. But there's it's not like a humorless movie. It's he it's could not... have pulled back on that punch. I did. I did. That's one. Him punching him. Gordon's like really cheesy and campy. And then him running. The whole like after he shoots up and he's like <laughs> and he's like shaking and they're like calm down, big guy. That's another one. When, like, they're at the opening crime scene and the guy has to, like, come in to, like, note it down. He's walking over the camera pans and he bumps into his chest and he's like, excuse me. That's one. The whole, like, thumb drive thing. Okay, the one. thumb drive. So, that was that was one. The past two days, my friends that I saw it with, we have been quoting everything that they thought was cheesy. URL, I laughed out loud. When they, they had the L, what was it? Um, El Rata... Yeah, you are L R yeah, L R. You are L. I was like, okay, buddy, that's a stretch. Some of the other ones, like thumb drive, my my friends have been they they cannot get over how goofy that is. That's all okay. Riddler's fault, though. I was okay with it at the time. I felt like he like Riddler was playing it for a pun, but I didn't feel like that was the writer trying to be clever. I think they kind of did. No, but it's dark humor. Like <laughs> I think that's why. You can see, like, with Batman's delivery, like, he pulls it out slowly, lifts it up, makes eye contact with Gordon. Thumb drive. It's like Batman, to a certain degree, is enjoying this, too. Even when he gets the penguin to, like, flip over in his car, and then he slowly walks, and he just, like, bends down and looks at him for, like, two seconds. Like, that shit is so funny. <laughs> I-, I wish that scene ended so differently on my email line you, <laughs> bro. He was looking at him like he needed. Really looked out and like I could see the Instagram meme of like James Charles being like, "Hi, sisters," and I'm just like, "This is fucking ridiculous." What if he walked up to him and said, "Your blinker, you left your blinker on." <laughs> <laughs> see, 
that would have been, that's what the MCU version would have been. <laughs> they at least didn't have like MCU quips in this. That that I think would have been a major takedown for me. If that like it leans into it a little, but I feel like there is kind of an ambiguity to it in terms of like whether stuff is a joke at several points. Like, is it being goofy and or, or is it like being earnest and it's just not landing? Like the one that this wasn't a joke. The like final shot of like Batman and Catwoman going their separate ways felt a little. They definitely weren't playing it for a joke, but it definitely came off as like a little bit cute for how dark this movie was trying to be. This is not a joke, but I couldn't help but think of the Furious 7 thing. I Ah. never actually saw that movie, but I know about that, where they went their separate ways down the thing. That's all I could think about in that scene. I was thinking it was like that, I don't know if this is a meme or not, or if I've just seen it, like that, that thing where like you you say goodbye to someone and then you start walking the same way. I thought they were... (laughs) That was that was what I was thinking. And then, like, they stopped next to each other. And I was like, are they just going to do another goodbye scene here? And then they, they don't. And that then he looks at her in the rear view until she's gone. Poetry. What do you think the genre is? I mean, you said something. I mean, definitely this takes from detective genres stuff, which I enjoyed. I think David was the one who mentioned, like, that he wanted some detective stuff. I definitely liked that part of it a lot. I felt a lot of influence from... A lot of people were saying Seven when the first trailers came out. I see that. And also a ton of Zodiac. Like, the Riddler is almost just the Zodiac killer. With Like, he has the same cipher. He has a really similar mask to one that's used. At least in, in the David Fincher Zodiac movie. I've never seen those movies, but... I feel like they did a good job with the casting for Riddler. He he was a little hammy, but I guess that, that comes with the territory. But he really did look like a serial killer. Like, mm-hmm. some plain old dude you would never expect. Just some white guy. They're always just some white guy from, like, some, like, Wisconsin-ass state. Yeah, and he had he had glasses and everything, and that... Man, did they make him look like he belonged in this world as the Riddler. Uh, that was really good. Yeah, the casting for that was a one. What yeah, did you guys Paul... think about when he got arrested and, like, the face he made? Because I, when I was watching it, I was like, oh, my God, he's really, like, getting off to being arrested. And, like, in his head, he's like, I'm going to kill every single one of these cops that are doing this to me. And, like, he's, like, making the list in his head. Have any of you guys seen Prisoners with Paul Dano? Nah. I, I don't know a ton of Paul Dano's filmography, but his role in that felt the most similar to his performance here. The only thing I'm familiar with him is that one, I saw that one scene for some reason with uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, and he was slapping him or something, and then Daniel oh, that's Day-Lewis there started screaming, I abandoned my child. But he was hamming it up there, too. So I was like, Yo, what, are you, what are you doing? What is this? Mm-hmm. I don't know what I'm watching. If you were to like take a mugshot of Riddler from this movie and say he killed 13 people by like scooping their brains out or something, I believe you. Yep. Like, I don't think that's that's clickbait. That's that's how seriously good this casting was. As as far as the look, at least. Again, for me, he hammed it up a little bit on the Riddler end with the screaming and the Ave Maria. That was a lot. Who said this was Thriller? Hassan? Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking it's, it's somewhere, but I think we got the genre down. David, what did you think it was? I think it's, yeah, it's in that, like, noir detective thriller. Okay. Yep. How, how well does the, does the pacing fit with the genre? For me, uh, I thought, well, again, there were a few dull moments for me. I think they could have been cut. I might be in the minority, but I never, I didn't really mind the pacing. I don't think movies should always be three hours long, but I think in this case, like, I really didn't have a problem with it. From my memory off of the first viewing, each scene that happened, it added something to the plot, with the exception of, like, some of, like, the uh, character building scenes, like, between him and Alfred, or some of the Falcone scenes. I feel like some of those, I could understand, like, why, like, I've heard people complain about some of those scenes, so that's why I'm just mentioning those. 
other than that, I really felt like maybe it was a mental trick, but anytime I saw him in the bad suit, which was predominantly most of the film, I'm thinking something's about to go down. So in my head, it's like an action scene when it really is not. So I think that may be why it didn't feel too long to me or too drawn out. But yeah, I think I really like the pacing. I was good with the pacing for most of it. The first hour and a half-ish, that moved pretty nicely to me. Like when it was doing like the earlier detective work, I thought the pacing of that was excellent. Like a lot of momentum going through nice ebbs and flows. It did kind of drop off a bit in the second half. Second you fully Hassan on the stuff with Falcone, I did not need any of that. And I felt like that was the only, like that's the 25 minutes of the movie I feel like I wanted to get rid of. But take that out and you've got a pretty tight two and a half hours that is pretty solidly paced. And I felt like if we're calling it either thriller or like mystery detective genre, like there was good momentum and like stuff to keep you on the hook throughout it. This isn't exactly pacing, but it it maybe is kind of tied in with it. Like for the amount of stuff that this movie crams in, I feel like it balances out pretty well with the exception of some of the Falcone subplot. I did not feel lost or confused almost ever during this. And they're, it's balancing a lot. And I was impressed with how well they were able to like make it easy to digest and like do some really efficient exposition with stuff earlier on. That does fall off a bit closer to the end, again, mostly with the Falcone stuff. But aside from that, I was very happy with how they approached it. I think it really helped. Well, this goes without saying, but it really helped to have Alfred, Jim, and Catwoman there to like bounce these mm-hmm. clues and stuff off of. Definitely. We made it go smoother instead of him narrating to himself. Also, it made their characters have weight, so it's not just like they're just there. You know what I mean? And even, like, I don't know exactly how this ties in, but I think some stuff with Catwoman falls off, but one bit that I liked was when she and Batman were teaming up earlier on and she goes into that club and kind of defects from his objective. Like, that gave that scene a lot more, I don't know about tension, but, like, it threw in some conflict beyond just having her, like, it wasn't just investigating, there was, like, there was conflict between them, and I thought that helped keep us engaged. They kind of dropped the ball with some stuff with her later, but I that's a good blend of character and plot, I think, and like this did that well in a few ways. While we're talking about the side characters, let's talk about um talk about good old Gordon. Anybody want to start? I've been starting a lot of these. I really liked Gordon. I really liked Jeffrey Wright's take on him. I have never been the biggest Gordon fan. I always found him to be the most boring part of Batman's kind of gallery of characters because he was the most just normal. He was just the police officer. And, like, even Batman, like, sure, he's fighting crime, but he is an anti-hero. He does go a little further than a police officer usually would. So I enjoyed that. And then all of his villains have their abilities and everything. So I usually just didn't have much for stakes with Gordon until they kind of bring his daughter in and they bring that whole kind of dynamic in. Then I kind of got more invested in him. So to have just Gordon in this movie and for me to like, like you said in your notes, like I really did care about him. And like, that's just a testament to Jeffrey Wright. Like he's a phenomenal actor and like, I don't know. He really balanced having the authority over the room. Like he was able to, control the other cops and batman to a certain extent but also you know he's not commissioner yet you know that one guy when he comes in like you understand he's still just lieutenant so there is room for him to grow and change and i liked that i like that they didn't just give him the commissioner role yeah i'm with david i've never cared about jim gordon i'm just like i never cared about batman so i never gave him a second thought even when he's played by jk simmons when I say Jim Gordon was my favorite character in this movie, I, I really couldn't even explain why, but Jeffrey Wright did a phenomenal job making me care about a character I've never even thought about when he wasn't directly in front of me, being black helped. But every scene he was in, uh, the fact that he was one of the only good cops, he was willing to 
shoot to kill at one point. I think it was when they were, there was one scene when they were hunting down the Riddler, but they, they didn't come face to face with the Riddler. Uh, drawing his weapon, but, you know, your boy stopped him because no guns. Yeah, they don't know what David said. I'm, I don't even really know why, but he just did it. It was awesome. I never really hated Jim Gordon to begin with, but I think the reason why I like this take a lot more, I, I'm with you. I'm trying to figure out what specifically made me walk away with a favorable reaction, like an overly favorable reaction. And I think it goes back to just how useful he was as a character. Like, he displayed his intelligence, his combat prowess, his lack of fear, and like David said, his ability to command the room despite not being a commissioner. Like, every turn he was risking his career, and he still did, like, the decision that would, like, essentially put his life worse than where it's at. He even had that scene where Batman was like, no guns. He's like, that's not, bro, like, that's your thing. That's not my thing. Like, I feel like he's the most relatable version of Gordon versus, like, the the typical, like, do-gooder, lawful good version we're used to. I feel like this version was a little more just realistic and more like you could put yourself in his shoes a lot easier because not everyone is able to relate to always doing what's right this guy just did what he thought i don't know how to phrase it but you he's doing what he believes is right which is not always the quote-unquote good guy thing to do you know like it's not the good guy, guy thing. thing the law exact that's the word lawful it's not the lawful thing to do but he still did it i also couldn't take that one guy that one cop seriously i think he was above him he had like a really like raspy yeah the guy who says happy halloween was that him the same? yeah he's the he's the commissioner and he gets his face eaten by the rats he's the second riddler victim he's like come on gordon he could be a vigil he's a vigilante how do you know he's not a part of this yeah and it that uh it was that scene in the the jail right where he just woke up i think he's dead by that point no, because then there was a guy in the in the jail scene. Yeah, I know you're talking about. You're talking about the guy. He has like the mustache, and he looks like the cook from Ratatouille. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he's the one who like push. He's like he said, "Put your hands up, you goddamn son of a bitch." He says that to Riddler at the end. Yeah, the commissioner was in the beginning, like at the crime scene, Jay. Yeah, yeah I'm thinking of this, there was one guy, and in... you're thinking of the Ratatouille guy at the end. Yeah, get your shit together, Gordon. Or I'm gonna have to. He he sounded real. I could not take him seriously. His yeah. voice was too goofy. But one thing I was thinking about while you guys were talking about it, I was like, why did I like Gordon and Batman this relationship so much this time around? And I think because like as far as live action, like the only Gordon I really saw, I think that I comprehended this was commissioner gordon and not just like because when i was a kid and i was watching batman it was like if you're not batman and you're not a super villain you're just a throwaway character yeah. i didn't know who harvey dent was outside of two-face i don't know who commissioner gordon was so i was like oh, i don't know so i only really comprehended gordon when gary oldman did it for the nolan trilogy and he's great and whatever but their relationship in the nolan trilogy him and batman they're not it's not they're not close but their conversations are usually very focused on like their case and like the overall plot and what they're trying to achieve and what they have to do in this movie and what their goal is. But we saw moments in this version where like it felt like they were more like buddies, like when they were going and they were looking for the car and he was like, Batman says something like, why don't you, tr do you not trust me? And then Gordon like laughed and was like, do you trust me? I mean, shit, it's been two years now and I haven't even seen your face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like just stuff like that. And like the way that he was like, Gordon was willing to like put him in his place. Like he would go up, like he would put his arm against Batman's throat and be like, you better calm the fuck down. And even Batman's like, you too. And like he punched and uh, Gordon punches him in the chest. And I'm just like, this there's like there's obviously a kinship here and i really yeah. took to that yeah, yeah. it was like he doesn't want to see him fail they do a good job making you feel the history yeah yeah there's a respect that goes both ways with these two the two versions of of these characters here because i felt like I, the other gordon never did this exactly but like if the other batman if no one's batman were to like do something wrong that gordon i feel like would just go on the side of the cops versus this gordon like is seeing this batman's reckless and he's like essentially not a likable person in like the describable sense but he's still like listen bro you gotta get your act like, he's like trying to like only your real friend is gonna tell you yo you're acting crazy like someone who's not your real friend is not gonna pull you to the side and say yo you gotta chill you this is not how we do things you know i feel like that aspect of it is what made it feel like they had history i've seen the uh 
more recently in my memory, I've seen the uh, non-live action versions of Jim and Batman. I'm thinking of the Telltale series one. What is it? The Harley Quinn show one. And in both versions, it's really just Batman telling Gordon everything and Gordon just relaying that information to the police. So that's why I have more respect for this Gordon. Because again, like I said, it's a two-way respect thing. They're both figuring things out together and all that. And Jim likes to he, he puts Batman in his place a couple of times in this movie, so. Yeah, they were solving the case together. Like, they were on each crime scene together. Along with making their dynamic feel very lived in, I think they did a good job making Gordon feel more seasoned in this. Like, they kind of evolve the Gary Oldman Gordon a little bit in the Dark Knight trilogy, but I feel like in definitely in Batman Begins, it doesn't feel like it's his first day on the job, but it feels like he just transferred in from another city. Like, he does not feel that competent in yeah. that, at least in that part of the trilogy. Um, hey guys, I'm from Metropolis. What could go wrong in Gotham? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not canonically. It just, he kind of gives that vibe. My main note on Gordon, not really in keeping with the rest of yours, but he has, just, Jeffrey Wright great actor but he has so much gravel in his voice that if i wasn't watching the scene if i closed my eyes i would not be able to tell when it was batman talking and when it was gordon you gotta get your act together man guns are your thing batman my last topic i'm sure we have a couple other ones as well we haven't touched yet but last topic i brought was there are three to four villains in this movie they said it couldn't be done and I, I was going to say maybe it was just the Spider-Man movies were cursed, Maguire and uh, Garfield, but they pulled it off in Spider-Verse and, uh, heavy spoilers, No Way Home. They had Catwoman in this, but she wasn't really a villain, but she's known as, like, a villain at, like, the beginning of her stories whenever it's rebooted and then turns into an anti-villain. Uh, you had Penguin, who was a villain, Riddler, and Falcone, Falcone, however you want to say it. Yeah, what what did you guys think about them being able to... How, how do you think they did it? Well, it was a three-hour movie, so that's probably why. But how do you think they, they packed these so many antagonists into this? Is it because they connected them? Probably. That's exactly why. Because, like, you have the, the relationship between Falcone or, and uh, Catwoman. And then you have Penguin and Falcon um, Cone working together or whatever. And then you have the overarching villain is Riddler. But they're all like intertwined and connected. And by like giving them each their own amount of screen time or less or more or whatever, I think that's how you're able to balance it. I never found Falcone interesting. The most interesting take I've seen on this character is if you guys ever get the chance to check out, I think it's like the Long Halloween. It's called it's Batman and Long Halloween. It's two parts, but it has a very similar storyline with how they handle his like background and with Bruce's and how it intertwines. But that's probably like the best portrayal of that character I've seen. But other than that, he for the most part, him and Maroney are just like, these mob bosses that Batman always stops in his first few years. Like I don't like them having more than than just that. Maybe that's my own bias though. I like this take on him. He he came off very creepy. He did his thing. Um the character I felt nothing really about. Yeah, I, I kinda wish I saw Pattinson's Batman get a little bit more aggressive with him based on like the universe that we're in and him finding out that this is potentially the person who really did and his parents like i would have liked to see more conclusion on that arc versus him being uh redemption or redemptive or whatever but that's me i i like that they didn't answer the question i was a little afraid they were going to it was like oh falcone put the head out great frick why did they why did they tell us i'm glad that they they don't know and it doesn't seem like they're going to figure it out um at least for a little while who, who killed his parents. Yeah, John, John Satoro, that's his name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he did a, as good a job as you can as a regular old mob boss in a superhero world. So it was cool. I didn't expect him to be everything in this movie, though. Like, he, he just did all the wrongdoings. Um, even though Riddler was literally killing people on screen, he was really just the, the big guy. Big guy to get. I will say the one silver lining is they didn't waste the villain. Like they used everything they could from him and then got rid of, got rid of him. So I can appreciate that. Mm-hmm. I'm glad he won't be in future movies. Yeah, you know I think that's that's fair. I could appreciate that. I don't want to be too harsh on it. Yeah, it makes room for the other ones. Yeah. 
Evan, David, you know, some for the three to four villains, I don't think this did it that bad. Like it didn't feel like it was holding it back, but it didn't do it amazingly either, in my opinion. Like there might be plot reasons that this couldn't happen. I kind of felt like they could have combined Falcone and Penguin into one character. Or they could have reduced their role. I kind of said it before. I I was not into the like anything that happened with Falcone. I don't know his character outside of. Uh, I think he's in Batman Begins, and then Maroni's the Dark Knight. But um, I don't. I didn't know him outside of that. But I I really didn't need him in this movie. I thought it. You know, it it balanced the three villains okay. Yes, I forget who said it, but the three hour runtime certainly did not hurt with that. But I think, yes, it's possible to do more than two villains well, but it's definitely harder. I I don't know that this and the other examples you cited should necessarily be like a green light. Like, hey, guys, let's cram as many villains as we can into the next movie. I don't think that should be the move. In the slightest. Please don't. But it can be done. So that's, that's worth noting. Yeah, I'm just happy it's been proved to be possible in both Marvel and DC. So yeah, yeah, that's definitely that's definitely a plus. Yeah, because I think my little like spiel on it is like I think we see now at least that filmmakers are understanding that villains don't necessarily have to translate to antagonists. Like as much as there's four villains, there's not four antagonists in this movie. Like penguin really is not doing anything that's going to mm-hmm. hurt batman or throw the plot off and neither is catwoman it's really riddler and then they try to like shoe in falcone with that but it does feel a bit awkward i am with evan on that where i think they drag it out a bit too much and i do love his performance i think the actor's phenomenal in it but i don't think the material that he's performing is that phenomenal so it just kind of deflates there I did really love how they balanced the Riddler. I think, especially if anyone's an old school fan of how they designed him, like he's supposed to be this crazy, like Eminem stan. And he's just like, oh, I stand Batman. I love Batman. I love Batman. And he's supposed to just hate Bruce Wayne. And like, they really don't usually do that in any iteration that I've seen animated or live action, but they balanced that. And they did it really well in that scene where he like kind of, tiptoes on making him think he knows who he is but then he realized he doesn't and you see like the release on batman's face where he's like okay he doesn't know i'm bruce okay and then we can keep talking do you really think he does that he does what do you really think he knows it's bruce wayne no he doesn't Mm. i don't think he does Uh, i was just thinking it's possibly maybe he made batman think that because i think he's being very especially how the riddler is in the comics like until Batman does define that line to him where he's like, we're not working together. You're, you're not fighting crime with me. Like you're, you're a sadistic psychopath. We're not the same thing. That's when Riddler's like, okay, F you. I'm going to continue to ruin your life. And I think that was the moment they were showing was because he really is writing these love letters to Batman. It's like, oh my God, I'm doing this for us. We are the redemption. And he's like, you're sick. And then he's like, are you kidding me? And before that, he has that whole, like, we almost got them all, all but Bruce Wayne. But the other thing that I was going to say about just from a screenwriting perspective, especially with the three hours, I think what really helps balance these four characters, these four villains out, is Matt Reeves and the other screenwriters were very smart in designing not only the structure, but also the location of where these characters were going to intersect making the iceberg lounge kind of the central place for just the audience to understand like they might not all be doing the same things at the same time but falcone's there selena's there penguin's there and the riddler's right down the street spying on them and it's like you have enough familiarity so from the first act to the third act there's enough of like thematic circularity there where he's going back to reinterrogate falcone and everything that you feel like, okay, we've been through this story, and even though Gotham is huge, and this has been a three-hour long movie, I didn't get lost. Yes. This is the most familiar I've ever felt with Gotham out of, like, any Batman project, outside of the video Mm. games. Yeah. Because, like, Kylie Davis said that you, they kept repeating locations and, like, making you familiar with where things were. Plus, you see, like, Batman go from the city 
to the back cave and like yes most movies show him like drive there but i, I liked how like the, the pacing of it, like you see each shot each street or whatever and it kind of made you feel like you knew like which direction it was i already didn't want to live in gotham but this movie just made me not want to live in gotham even more like they did a really good job at painting what a just the worst place this place is it's always raining it, it, and they uh i think it was cosmonaut that i always mention him in his review he mentioned they never showed the city during the day they rarely did and i think that helped with the, the actual yeah. physical darkness of the movie. Uh, that's another thing the movie was really hard to see at some points like a little it was it's very dark yeah he is a nocturnal animal though as he says yeah, the glasses that was a nice touch because the only time the only time it was during the day was like with the funeral scene when the Riddler had the hostage come and then when um Riddler first killed the guy like on Halloween when his family left it was quote unquote light outside it wasn't the daytime but it was like nearing sunset yeah there were a lot of sunset scenes on the roof and, and that then... was the closest we got I really want to see what they do once they incorporate a super powered villain into this if at all because I also feel like they'd only choose villains that don't have superpowers. Like, how would a Poison Ivy fit? David, don't say anything. <laughs> or or a Clayface. I think Mr. Freeze for a sequel would be terrifyingly awesome. I saw a fan cast for Giancarlo Esposito. I forget his name from The Mandalorian, but he's also uh, in Better Call Saul. Moff Gideon. Moff Gideon. Um, and he's... God, I am not remembering any of his roles that I've seen him in. What was what was his role in The Boys? What's his name? Stan? Edgar. Stan, Stan Edgar. Edgar. Yeah. I think Breaking Bad. I've never seen Breaking Bad, but I'm pretty sure he's in that. Far Cry. Far Cry 6, right? Yeah. I've seen fan casting for him to be Mr. Freeze, and I, I would just love nothing more than that. The director teased that specific villain, actually. Like, nothing confirmed, but that is a villain that he said he was interested in. I feel like that's a really logical, like, the most logical next step this could take before introducing anybody like Bane or anything like that, too. You have to baby step to that, like, fantastical aspect of Batman. Yes, yeah, because Mr. Freeze, there's been renditions, like, shout out to the, like, it was like mid-2000s, the Batman animated series, where it was made me like so many of these villains so much more. But that, the Mr. Freeze and that did have superpowers, like he had ice powers. And his, like, helmet, instead of, like, being the glass, classical helmet, it was just a casing of ice frozen over his head. And he had, like, red eyes going through it. It was really cool. Jumping off of that, I know you have a Joker rant coming up. Mr. Freeze is actually my favorite Batman villain by far. That's more than fair. Was more than, I have no argument. It's actually funny to me that you guys brought him up because after I saw it the first time with my friends, the two people I brought up, I was like, you know who I would, the two villains I'd want to see enter this world? Poison Ivy, because I wanted to see how do they bring that in. Like you said, like she's so just super that it's like, how are we going to see how that intertwines? And then Mr. Freeze. <laughs> I was like, Mr. Freeze. Oh yeah, I didn't even catch that pun, but look at me. And then Mr. Freeze is so... That's just, it would work. Like, how they did the Riddler, I was like, I want to see the Mr. Freeze take. I didn't know that casting choice, so that's a phenomenal casting choice. Also, Joker's in this. Which is a horrible decision. I yeah, I was happen. not here for that. Thank you. Why, Thank though? You. Please, go to your thoughts. I'm open to understanding both interpretations as to why people might like seeing him, and I understood why the studio put him in, but I want to know why people dislike it. I have Joker fatigue. Like, the way that they're has been a movie with three Spider-Man coming together. I would love to see a Joker-verse movie where it's just all the different Jokers. You could be, bring back Heath Ledger from the dead, give me Joaquin, give me that, uh, Jared Leto, give me Hugh Jackman, or not Hugh Jackman, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> Jack Nicholson. Jack yeah, Nicholson. And then just crazy. throw in Hugh Jackman just cause. <laughs> Jack Nicholson, bring in Mark Hamill as the animated one. Like, I don't care. Like, bring in Jared Leto, Joker get killed off. Yeah, like, it's just bring in the one from Lego Batman. Like, bring in the one from the Harley Quinn show. Like, bring in any version, every version. Because it has gotten so ridiculous the amount of Jokers I have seen in the past, like, five to six years. Like, I'm over it. I agree with everything you said. Sidebar, I don't hate Jared Leto's Joker. I think he got robbed. Apparently, he had a lot more screen time and all that. So I do feel bad for that man because he put the work in. I mean, as a controversial topic, is there's a reports about him being creepy on set. Yeah, so I, I don't know about all that, but um, 
Yeah, if there's any truth to the rumors of him not getting screen time, then I feel bad, but neither here nor there. I think the Joker, he's been done. Like, it's been seen already, and the reason why people love him is specifically because of Mark Hamill and then because of Heath Ledger, right? There's so many villains that we can do that same amount of treatment to. All you have to do is just give them that time. It's also, like, my issue with DC. Like, they focus so hard on Batman and Superman. And then now they're just giving Wonder Woman her time in the light. Now they're starting to give Aquaman a little shine, Flash here and there. But, like, it's just always been the animated movies, the show. It's always been Batman and Superman. And I get why, but, like, DC's never going to compete with Marvel if they don't give their side people the light of day. Like, no one knew who the Guardians of the Galaxy was until Marvel put a movie and made you go watch it. Nobody cared about Iron Man before 2008. It was always Spider-Man, the X-Men, and Hulk. No one cared about Iron Man. No one cared really about Captain America until those movies came out. And until DC starts to learn that you have to, like, the Justice League animated series made Green Arrow so cool, you know? Like, it took so many characters and it put them in the front lines because you had to care now. They had Red Tornado, Martian Manhunter, and now they're all gone. So, like, if DC wants to level up, even with Batman, you gotta do the same thing with the villains. And I feel like there's enough there to work with that, like, you can make a movie without the Joker. I feel like the Joker is just so overdone, and it's just annoying. And connect your damn universes, bro. How many different timelines do they have going on? Bring in the Joker from the Gotham TV show. Jerome Valasco. Oh, they had a really dope... The way they did that Riddler costume, I can't remember if I remember it correctly, but that's like the closest you're going to get to like a comic accurate costume that does not look ridiculous. I got to Google it to make sure I'm not sure enough. I, I was just thinking about more Batman villains. Scarecrow, wouldn't, wasn't he the villain in Batman? I didn't see Batman Begins. He was the villain. He, he is the villain in Batman Begins, yeah. Okay, I was going to say I wanted to see that for this. I take back what I said in my comment about that suit in Gotham. <laughs> I take back what I said. Oh, uh, about. <laughs> I don't know, I it's hard to make Joker. Riddler not look ridiculous and be kind of accurate. <laughs> they have the Titans. Like, I, I don't want to talk about the Titans a TV show. They have that going on. It just finished season three. My like, God, do they have no idea where they're going with that show. What else? Doom Patrol? Apparently that's separate from Titans. Peacemaker? I don't know where that's connected. The Suicide Squad? Don't know how that connects to the main... Sh- like joker with joaquin Finn. like yo if you if y'all don't get y'all shit together bro because i have no idea who's gonna take the time or who has taken the time and try and connect what's continuous with with what else like i, I don't i think a uh, warner brothers exec came out today or yesterday and said dc moving forward is going to focus on quality stories over connected universe and the way you do that is you pick the right filmmaker i'm not gonna lie i think moving forward i kind of prefer that route I would love, like, the kid in me would love nothing more than to see, like, Aquaman, Batman, and Shazam all on the same screen, right? But at the end of the day, I don't, when they got rid of Zack Snyder and then you started doing the other reboots and the other characters, you they kind of, like, shot themselves in the foot. The way they mistreated Ray Fisher and didn't even acknowledge it and all that, I feel like there's nothing they could do to re, re like, fix everything, you know? So I would rather DC move forward, just hire the right director and screenwriters and take each of their characters and give them compelling stories the way they give, like, Batman in this iteration of compelling story. Like, we have a Nolan trilogy, and now we have this new trilogy. We have enough, like, live-action quality Batman films. I would love for, like, a live-action quality... I don't know, Superman. like a red... Super, uh, no, definitely not. Though I liked Man of Steel. Like, they grounded him very well and made him feel human. I liked how he killed somebody, but that's not the example you used earlier, so you don't get that credit. But yeah, there's enough characters to use that I feel like they could do a lot of good films. I, yeah. Red Hood. Yeah, Red Hood. He was disappointing. I guess you, you don't have to connect your things, but you're gonna I think you're gonna get less back from that because they're not all connected. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe not, because a lot of people don't have to catch up on movies and movies before in order to watch the new movie that just dropped they can pick and choose what they like and want to see so i guess not Sucks, man. it is what it is we'll, we'll see where they go from here i mean i'm excited to see more from this version of batman so yeah that, that's all i had for to- uh, my topics uh did y'all have some others you want to touch i wanted to get into riddler a bit more than we have to some other areas i don't know any prior versions of Riddler aside from the fact that Jim 
Carey played him. I don't know much about that, but I was surprised at how much I liked this Riddler. For one thing, he had a really well thought out plan. And as far as I could tell, maybe I'll see something else if I watch it again, but it doesn't seem like his plan hinges on Batman doing anything that he has like no way of knowing that Batman would do. Like he left him breadcrumbs and led him to like the, his plan came to fruition and it didn't feel implausible, which is a disappointingly rare thing. Like even the Joker in the dark Knight, people love that as like one of the greatest villains of all time. Even that has some things where like stuff kind of has to go a little conveniently for the Joker, for his plan to work. And I didn't feel that happening for Riddler here. He felt like he was just planned it out meticulously you didn't figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to watch it all happen from here. Like he was ready to bottom for Batman. And he was like, I douched it all, my guy. What do you mean? And Batman's like, get the fuck away from me. Bottom for Batman. I missed that. That's hilarious. <laughs> I totally missed that. Sorry. I'm... No, it's okay. It's okay. My only real criticism for him was he waits way too long to attack people. He may have only done it twice, but he's like sitting in the back of the car in the opening scene, he's, like, standing in that room for, like, a full minute and a half with the TV on. The dude could turn around any second. He's, like, waiting for the guy to notice him. Like, no, just just drop him as soon as you can. Being polite, he had to finish his phone call. Yeah, well, I guess the phone call, maybe, like, he, he wouldn't want, like, people to be alerted that soon. I and guess. in the car, he was just waiting for dude to put a seatbelt on, safety first, you know, before I put a saw trap <laughs> on your neck. Yeah, the, the car one, I really don't get. But, like, even, I think there's a there's several seconds, maybe even a full minute after the guy puts the phone down, that he doesn't attack him in the house. Like, Yeah, he doesn't hit him until he takes a step. Like, once we see the Riddler is there, he stands in the same position, and once he takes the step forward, Riddler just, like, pounces on him. I feel like he wants to get caught. Like, there's a thing about him, like, not being noticed. And, like, once he's caught, he has, like, that weird smiley, whatever face that was. That's for I... <laughs> serial killers, like, in yeah. real life, too. So that, yeah. that's another thing. Like, I wonder if that's what it is. Like, they're playing off that. He's... Yeah. They want someone to appreciate their work. That's something I've heard as well. Um, like, if he knocks him out, it's not fun for him if you don't know I knocked you out. Like, I want you to see me get scared type of thing. Uh, that's just me guessing. I don't know if that's what they're really going for. Because I, I think that's a fair critique. It would track with other things that I've heard. No, I definitely think it's a fair, like, character to read, though. Because, like, he goes to his own bombing. He's yeah. been recording. He's building up fans. He's trying to pass his legacy on. He's like, you guys can do this next. And, like, to what Evan was saying in the beginning, like, his plans, he can do all of his plans, and they don't hinge on Batman, but he's so delusional and he's so crazy that he's convinced himself that because of Batman, he has been able to achieve this, like, higher power, and he uses it to, like, validate his psychopathic tendencies, and it's just so disturbing to watch. Yeah. And he even said, like, no one ever noticed me until now. And if you really think about it, we didn't even see this man's face until act two slash three yeah very late like a solid two hours in i also liked that his plan was to mobilize his following it was better i thought than having him and batman have a showdown because that just even if he set like a bunch of traps or something that would have felt kind of dumb and instead like i feel like there aren't many climaxes where the only goal is just to beat up a bunch of henchmen, but I thought it worked really well for this. I, again, I don't know the history of the Riddler, but this is a great update for him where he's like this fringe TikToker or whatever with his, or that he has this like niche following of a bunch of other like militia people that are also just like have the same angst and delusions as he does. I mean, one, I think it's just a good thing to villainize because that's, like, a real problem. I'm not going to mention some recent events or people, but there's definitely parallels that I saw to some real-world stuff. So I liked that. And my favorite thing I think about this movie is the way that Riddler shows Batman, like, the downside of his influence. 
because it, at least in the Dark Knight trilogy, I don't know if this is true of other Batman media, but Batman's goal in or a major goal that he has in becoming Batman is to be a symbol that inspires other people. And I like that this take kind of shows that, yeah, if most of what you do is beat the shit out of people, probably you're going to inspire other people to, you know, become violent vigilantes. It's not that surprising. <laughs> That's a very good point. Like, you're, the fact that your biggest fan is a serial killer, that tracks. Again, like I said at the beginning, I, I don't that Batman chooses to be Batman with his wealth, but I'm wondering if maybe they'll take that into the sequel that now that he has kind of had his eyes open at the end of this movie that maybe I have more to offer than just taking revenge on petty criminals to like vicariously avenge my parents like i i liked that he came around to that realization and realized that maybe i'm not inspiring what in the best way that i could be that's a great theme i think for a superhero movie to go into and also like a good thing for art to examine because you know i've thought about this theme a lot through like the lens of art as like you want your work to inspire people but you only have so much control over how they take it um, i'm probably extrapolating this too much but like i think it's a good theme to examine of like what is the role of the creator in this case like batman would be a creator and what is the role of like the audience and i like that this is kind of an indictment of like Hey, Batman fans, this isn't how to be a Batman fan. <laughs> that that was how I read it. Maybe that's just me seeing what I want to see. But I that was my favorite part about it. And kind of tangentially with that, there was a bit where Riddler calls out, like, how he also has an orphan and, like, other orphans like him. He kind of takes Bruce Wayne to task on, like, you're only special because you have resources. Everyone else who's lost their parents wants to do what you do. You're not special. You just have privilege. Maybe I'm paraphrasing too much from that, but I thought that was a that was an interesting thing that they threw in as well that I liked. Mm. This isn't a topic, but I just want to say it was very nice to see Andy Serkis in a performance that he's actually Andy Serkis and not like a CGI gremlin or monkey or anything else. That was yeah. that's refreshing. It took him a while, but he's there. Well, he was yeah. Claw. Yeah. He was Ulysses Claw in Black uh, yeah. Panther. He, he transcended Marvel and DC. Like, look at him. He directed Venom 2 and started Batman within, like, the, a year time frame. Like, that's crazy. Right? He directed Venom 2? Yeah. Oh. He did. Oh, no. CGI guy. That's one of the, Venom 2, was, say what you want about it. I, I liked it way better than Venom 1. Man. What? You like Venom? We're not gonna do this. This is this is about bad. Oh, uh, but yeah, Eddie Cirque is definitely great to see him on screen. I agree with you. Uh, but cinematography, though, back to the I was trying to remember what the topic we were on. That car chase scene is probably my, in my memory, my favorite car chase scene that I've ever seen on film. I liked how every time Batman's perspective, it was looking forward, and Penguin's it was looking back. I know it sounds kind of like obvious or evident, but like that's like little things like that. Like, and you, and it felt like. Those were all moments that I've been on the highway where you're like you you're rushing somewhere, and there's someone on your left and right and in front of you, and those are like more relatable, realistic things that happen on the highway. This wasn't like a Fast and Furious or like a stereotypical Hollywood movie where like the highway's clear and there's one truck and then you get past the truck and then now you're you're home free. You know what I mean? Like it was a bunch of cars and situations that are real life uh, occurrences. However, I hate the fact that they literally killed a bunch of people on the highway. And then immediately after he grabbed Penguin out the car, it was just interrogate him, tie him up, and leave. Like, if I was Batman, I'm messing Penguin up. After you make me chase you on the highway for two hours, I'm putting you in the hospital. Like, you're not just going to walk away from the... 
I'm gonna push back a little. I didn't I didn't love that car chase. Also, uh, I don't know what you think of as relatable, but I relate much more to Mad Max Fury Road because my car has flames coming out of it. I don't know about you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, so you have people acrobatically jumping around you too. Yeah, I got a dude on top of my car with a flamethrower guitar, it's lit. Tom Hardy is driving. No, Tom Hardy's on the front as my blood bag. I'm not gonna hate on the car chase scene. I I was underwhelmed by it. I've seen I, I think I've seen much better than that. Although I did like the trailer moment where it fly the Batmobile flies out of the explosion. Like that was pretty boss. The footsteps, you, man. The walking. The that was good. Footsteps. That was good. Yeah. The crunching. You could those tell footsteps were ooh, those boots were heavy. Yeah, he definitely had his Tim's on. <laughs> uh the music i forgot the, the theme already but i know it's a good one so many boars so many boars i remember it playing after the car flip and then he walked up to penguin like you got car insurance for this <laughs> that was crazy that was a whack thing to that scene uh, the theme song definitely stuck in my head like days after I left the theater. Maybe it was because of the trailer, but like that theme song, I don't know. I like the build up of it for sure. I hear your point, Evan, about it being the boise you, as you call it. But yeah, I think it, I think it fit the lore theme very well. It wasn't trying to do too much, so I, I liked it. it. Every great theme for these superhero movies just has like six notes or less, like mm-hmm. the main pretty much man thing to it. Avengers, ooh, that amazing Spider-Man 2 theme. Can't get that out of my head, ever. Yep. That's been out of my head. All right, David, you can <laughs> leave at any time. The Danny Elfman <laughs> one from Spider-Man? Uh, that's in my head. Come on. Yeah. I'm standing Hans. No that's problem. only because I've seen it so many times. But I'm, I'm with Hans. I don't know what did it, but there was a moment in this film where I'm listening to the music. Cause I feel like I heard the theme several times throughout the movie. I felt like at one point I was like, is this what Batman like hears in his head when he goes out at night? Like this. It definitely <laughs> is. Yeah, it that's kind of like the vibe is. I got from. <laughs> when he walked over to Penguin's car, he definitely was humming it. To... <laughs> he's trying not to speed watch so there's no more explosions behind him. He's like, I'm going to walk slow, but like fast enough. pulsing in his skull because all the shit he takes, he gets his face blown off by the bomb. When he jumps off the tower, his head slams into like the train rail. That guy has a thumping brain. His mouth was unfazed. I want to see Batman when space. he goes like fully like geriatric senile and just starts like assaulting people. Just imagine him dressed up in a full bat suit, just punching the shit out of old people and then old rallying at their feet, like... right? Like hitting him with his walker, just as all the What's blood force moves in his wheelchair. Right. Like you're in it. You're in your wheelchair right now. When's bingo night? He can't get through it because it gets like the cape stuck under it, so he starts pulling himself when he's trying to wheel. Like, oh, oh, oh. Starts choking. That should be funny. Starts calling for Alfred. <laughs> He's way out of here. Can you imagine Alfred is just still alive? Three times older than him. <laughs> I was uh, interested by this take on Bruce Wayne. I'm used to the suave, like, Playboy version. But, like, if we're keeping it in line with, like, realism, if someone, like, sees their parents die and they don't really take it well, and they go train for 18... <laughs> they go train for... I wasn't even trying to be funny. <laughs> when they go train... They don't take it well. No, no. Like, <laughs> like worse than the average person... If they go train for 18 years and come back, you're not going to be, like, you're not going to be a playboy. You're going to be kind of, like, a basement dweller like he is. I kind of like that realistic take on it. In the prequel novel for the movie, there's a line, and he's like, yeah, I'm, like, not good at talking to women. There's a girl he was interested in who was, like, a race car driver, which is why he built his Batmobile, because it was for street racing. And he was, like, he was trying to flirt with her, and it, it, it is what it was, but he was saying, like, I'm not good at talking to women. Because, like, like, it's from his own thoughts. Kind of, like, Reminiscent of the intro of the movie when he's journalizing his like thoughts or whatever, it's like written in that perspective. So he's, he's like, I, I don't know, I wouldn't go that far, but he essentially like just was I mean, like, he's not good at socializing, which you could clearly see. People call his name in broad daylight. He just stares and looks away. Like that's not like a that's not something you do in conversation. Yeah, and then they look back and they say, well, he didn't take his parents dying that well, did he? (laughs) (laughs) Do you imagine, like, trying to cheer somebody up after that? Hey, man, don't even, like, look at it like that. Or, like, you get the call and then, like, you hang up and your friend's like, wow, you're taking that really well. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Good on you. I'm sorry, Asad. It's just the way you phrased it. No, no it's, it's all deserved. I think we should edit it, and I think that's how it should end. Did did we? I, I'm okay with skipping it, but did we want to bring up Catwoman? Yeah, we can. Phenomenal. She killed it. I don't like the fact I gotta find the interview where she was told she was too urban, but at the risk of being blackballed, I don't like that at all. I think that's ridiculous. Like you're telling me a girl who's raised in poverty and essentially has to come up by stealing from other people to make pay rent is too like out of this. I don't know. Like if anything, like not saying that's solely associated with urban people, but I'm just saying like it's it just comes off as like a lie. You're saying she's too urban for you is what you're saying, not for the role. I know that that one in that movie was different, but I just feel like if Zoe Crab is just too urban, then like there's many dark skinned actresses that are like much more darker than her. So if she's too urban, then like there's no chance of anyone else making it. So I kind of like did not like that she was told that, but I'm glad she did an amazing job here and like got her word out. Keep in mind for everyone listening, I myself am a black man, so that's where I'm coming from with it. I think in terms of making characters changing their race. For me personally, I prefer when it's a character that's introduced historically as black, like Black Panther or Luke Cage or Falcon. I'm not usually a fan of when they like just switch the race because oftentimes they don't really do it justice. But I think in this case, like, it was phenomenal and like I don't know, she killed it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen Catwoman like in the Harley. Well, I hate to compare it to this, but only recent thing that like, comes to memory. I've seen Cat uh, in the Harley Quinn TV show. Catwoman's black too. And Halle Berry, like the fuck. Did we forget Holly Berry was and then Woman? we put that movie out on her. I know, but it's still like I don't know the critique saying like Zoe Kravitz specifically is too urban. Like if you're gonna be racist, just be racist. Like you're just saying you're too black for this movie. Like yeah. as far as the definition of urban, how can Catwoman be too urban? She's from the city. This is Gotham. Everybody in the urban population is in Gotham. So it's like, all right, you're just racist in Hollywood. You also mentioned Eartha Kitt earlier. Um, literally 19, literally so, like it that's just like yeah whenever like they change the race of a character the actors always get attacked and no one ever comes to like their defense as far as the directors or whatever and then like they never even make it a point to like make their race uh like a part of their character in like the show so i just feel like i because it's never done properly i like it when they just make historically black characters and just that's like that because we don't have enough of those as is so i want to see more of those but if they do it, I'm never mad at it because that's a black person here in pain. I love to see it. So live action Static Shock one. I've been asking for this forever. We got Bronze Tiger. We got Vixen. We got Martian Manhunter. Like, come on, man. We need some more. I found an article. I didn't find the interview, but when you when you brought this as a topic, Asana, I looked up an article about it, and Zoe Kravitz said, at least from the article I found, that like. She doesn't know where the decision came from for Dark Knight Rises casting. I'm viewing this through the lens of a Nolan Knight. Like, it could have been Nolan, she said, but she doesn't know. If it is, I'm not going to defend him. But from the article I read, her point was kind of like, it's a frustrating and disheartening trend in the industry that any studio director, casting person, otherwise, whoever said it, like, it's just, it points to a trend that we should continue trying to get away from. Yeah. I really hope it wasn't Nolan who said that. You know, he does have a history of, like... Being racist? Casting, he has a history of casting overwhelmingly white casts. He's gotten a little better at that with Tenet. Tenet was pretty diverse on the whole, but historically, he has pretty overwhelmingly white movies. Yeah, that's because I didn't get a chance to find, like, this was... I was looking. I couldn't find, like, the interview where she said it. I just saw, like, reports on the interview. So I was trying to figure out who, who it was. That's why I wanted to, like, yeah, be clear. Yeah, I thought she did well here, though. Yeah. Um, although I, I still kind of prefer Anne Hathaway's Catwoman to this. But if we get more Zoe Kravitz, I'm very down for that. I thought they could have written her a little better. Oh, uh, that's racist, so I... Evan. She's black. You can't say anything negative about her as a white man. Just saying. <laughs> During woman's month, you sexist pig. Yeah, you brought it back. <laughs> right, I'm gonna stop digging then. Jay threw up an alley oop, but out of nowhere, ding! Yo, I was throwing up in the air. <laughs> I like her. She killed like, the good case and all that. Different hairstyles. They need to get her a better mask, though. That ski. I mask totally is... agree with that. 
I agree with like the DIY, but like, come on, like <laughs> whose identity was she trying to hide with that? I don't. Mm-mm. Yeah, it didn't even cover her nose. It like, didn't go. Yeah, it barely did. It was like a bandage over her nose, bro. Like it, and it didn't go with the suit either. It didn't bother me. It just felt like I think what bothered me specifically was like it was like different material than it's like drastically different material. I think yeah. It was like I don't know some cloth from a dollar store and like this high tech looking suit. Like all right, what? I, they're definitely gonna give her an upgrade in, in the event that she comes back, but like. I don't, Matt Reeves made it pretty clear that there's no guarantee anyone's coming back, like Joker, even Riddler. It's just, he was only in one movie at a time type of thing. I do not ship her and Batman as well. That felt very forced to me. Are you more of like a Batman Alfred kind of guy? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I ship them romantically, but that's <laughs> the best relationship across any of Batman stuff, I think. You know, I'm sure there's fan art for it, and I, I, I guess I'm okay with that. That's, but... It's like father and son, though. That's like yeah. Crazy. I wish they didn't feel the need to ship them in this. I thought they would have functioned better as just like partners in crime. Batman and Gordon. Yeah, I, yeah, I can see I, that. I, <laughs> no, that was a joke, Evan. Don't see. I didn't see that. <laughs> I know it was a joke, but I, you were I, I could mm-hmm. see it. They have more history. They have more history. They definitely have more chemistry. That is one thing I want to point out. Like the actors have like really appear to have good chemistry on screen. I would have to rewatch to see each specific dynamic, but like I don't know. Pattinson and Jeffrey Wright did a good job together. Uh, I really liked the monologue between him and Riddler, even though like it was really quick. But like seeing them meet face to face for the first time was really cool. That was very Christian Bale like. Yeah, I felt that there. Where's the trigger? Sorry. Are we done with that? Other, other topics? Other things you want to mention? I only have like a few fast points. I'm not going to deep dive on any of them, but just quick little things. The club and the twin scene was really funny. How like each time he pulled up, it was like a different re- different reaction. And it kind of kept, I thought it was just kind of like the closest thing to funny in the movie. How like one time he pulls up punches, one time he's like, I need to see Falcon in and out of the suit. I like that. Promotion was fire. I, I was really hyped for this movie. The marketing was like genius to me. It was, like, simple and effective. Oh, the last thing, I, I got kind of catfished with the fight scenes, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I liked how reckless and aggressive he was. I think it was realistic how, like, he gets hit as much as he dishes out sit, uh, hits or whatever. But in the trailer, that dude comes up with a bat, and he swings, and immediately after he swings, he comes with, like, a left hook. And Batman, like, cleanly, like, just, like, annihilates him, right? I'm thinking the fights are going to be like the games where like he's not getting touched and he's just taking you out. Swift. I thought it was going to be Preston Y left and right, bro. Yeah, like just countering everything and just dropping you. And I wasn't disappointed by any means by the fight scenes in that regard, but like I would have, that's what I thought we were going to get and then we did not get that. Like he was getting knocked around and then knocking right back. Like he was just throwing his life away, which fit, it, like he, he's walking, taking gunshot wounds to the chest like he's Superman because he is a Superman, you know? And I felt like it was impressive to see that he did that because it was more in like, Is that your last one? Definitely not. And, yeah. Hopefully in the next movie we can see something more in line with that. Because in that fight scene, he drops the first thug and then immediately gets knocked around. But that was it. Was, was that all your point? Yeah, they were like real quick. All right. Let's wrap up and go to the boilerplate then. Uh, next episodes, we have Tick, Tick, Boom and Parasite. You can check out our YouTube channel. We have our Patreon for $1 a month with bonus episodes. Our merchandise is on Zazzle. Our logo is by Kelsey Hendry. The show is on Twitter at INTAnalysis18. I am on Twitter at Ev underscore Wes. And where are all of you? I'm on Twitter, Jelani T. Kelly. And Instagram, Jelani T. Kelly. I also start uploading skits again. I'm on YouTube at Base Phoenix. I'm on Instagram at I am Vengeance. Just kidding. Don't follow my Instagram. You can find me at wherever Superman is not. Um, <laughs> coincidence? Uh, I think not. <laughs> All that rhymes. No, it did not. Those are two same words. No, it did not. But, no, it did not. <laughs> but, yeah, but you can find <laughs> you can find me at Instagram Asan Nazim. Look forward to never seeing Asan, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, so one way to end it. Yo, if this Superman movie drops, I need you to invite me for that one. Please. By all means, I need to be on that. Please. All right. Thanks for listening, guys.